content warning for genital talk. So if you do not want to hear about that, I would sit this one out. No hard feelings, take care of yourself. Hey you folks, Max here, and I'm fashionably late, as usual. Between all the bullshit with the baby and prep being covered in its entirety, including blood work, I knew that we should probably end up talking about prep, pep, HIV, U equals U, and U. That's a lot. <laughs> that it is. <laughs> but just in case one intro wasn't enough, hi folks, Max here. I make videos about sex, kink, and the occasional train video. <laughs> and this is Jasper, an actual sex health educator. Hi, I have done HIV related uh, sexual health education for at least three, three and a half, maybe almost four years. But sexual education and, and sexual health have been an interest of mine for a long time. But the conversation about HIV doesn't end with PrEP. In fact, it's just the beginning. So get prepared because we're going deep. Woof. But before we get ahead of ourselves, what's HIV and AIDS and what's PrEP, Jasper? HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. We've known about since maybe the 80s, maybe a little sooner. And essentially, it's transmitted through five different body fluids. There's semen, there's vaginal fluid, there's anal fluid, there's also blood, which most people remember, and there's also breast milk, which most people don't. HIV primarily stops the immune system from fighting off infections. If someone has it, they might get a secondary opportunistic infection, such as, but not always, a type of pneumonia that is relatively rare and the body normally fights off. There's also thrush, uh, toxoplasmosis, which for cat lovers, you've probably heard of because a lot of cat owners might get infected with that and not even know. But once someone's immune system is so battered down and they have one of these normally fought off infections, their body can no longer fight it off. And that's when someone may become quite sick and they have what's known as AIDS. Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. E. AIDS. E. PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Much easier just to say PrEP. And it's a medication that's given so that it can prevent someone from getting HIV. Chemicals in PrEP itself stop HIV virus from replicating or reproducing in the body. So it's no longer able to infect new immune cells and, you know, make itself bigger and take over the body. Instead, what will happen is those cells will die off and the body's immune system is able to get rid of the rest of the cells before they can do anything. So think about birth control, but for HIV. However, unlike birth control, you can do something called event-based dosing. What is that, Jasper? Event-based dosing, or sometimes called PrEP211, is when someone who may choose or not be able to do PrEP on an everyday basis will take it based off of when they anticipate having sex. So what happens is you'll have either Truvada or Descovy, which are the two uh, drug names for PrEP. And if you know you're going to have sex within the next two to 24 hours, you'll take two doses of the medication uh, before you have sex. Now, I'm going to repeat, you do have to take it minimally two hours before you engage in sex. Uh, after you've had sex, uh, 24 hours after you've taken those two pills, you'll take one other pill. Then 24 hours after that, you'll take another pill. And that's why it's called 211. However, if you're the proud owner of a vagina and you plan on having sex with that vagina, then event-based dosing is not for us. We need at least 21 days for the medication to really soak into our gorilla grips. That being said, if you had intentional exposure to HIV in the last 72 hours, consider PEP. What's PEP, Jasper? PEP stands for post-exposure prophylactic. It's a medication that people who may have been exposed to HIV really need to get within 72 hours of exposure. Uh, anything after that, and there's no real guarantee that the medication is going to be effective. PAP medication is often a series of two pills that have to be taken once a day for 28 days. What it does is it essentially floods the body with medication to disrupt the replication of those uh, HIV cells so that they can't 
reproduce and get into the reservoirs of the body and therefore what is called uh, serial convert over to HIV. Fun thing about, well I guess it's not fun, but a thing about uh, PEP is there's been some form of PEP since really AZT medication has been available. Uh, but mostly it was given to professionals like nurses or police officers who may have been exposed in the field. But the PEP that is available to non-professionals has been around since 2005. And a good way to access that is to go to an HIV clinic where they specialize in HIV or to the emergency room. So if PrEP is like birth control, then PEP is like plan B and it has around the same time window. Wow, Max, what an amazing metaphor. I'm subscribing right now. Well, if you're going to, I'd really appreciate it. But as we said before, PrEP is only the beginning on the conversation about HIV. But since only negative people can take it, and if you don't have insurance, then insurance companies covering PrEP doesn't necessarily help you out too much. However, depending on your state, you can get PrEP for free. Just consult this list first. And don't worry, I'll include a link in the description below. Therefore, Jasper, what are some other ways we can reduce our risk? Using any kind of barrier to keep your body separated from possible HIV carrying substances definitely help. Uh, that's why condoms, especially as the HIV epidemic started, became such a huge thing. Because condoms are really an excellent way to prevent getting HIV from sexual fluids. There are two types of condoms. So you have your external condoms, which are often thought of as the traditional condom that goes onto the penis. Or you actually have internal condoms as well, which can be put inside of the vagina and cover the cervix. And outside of that, there are just other ways that you can have sex that don't involve exchanging fluids, whether that's, you know, giving a handy or, <laughs> uh, you know, or mutual masturbation or things like that. Or also, cybering. Or cybering. What is it called? Uh, what do the, what do the uh, millennials call it? Sexting? Do a, you do a little sex? A little sex. That's Unlike nice. back in my day when you had to use a typewriter to send them. Message. A telegraph. A telegraph, if you will. I use the Pony <laughs> Express to send those erotic Carrier messages. Carrier pigeon. Carrier pigeon. <laughs> Sex pigeons. Sex pigeons. Are getting tested on a regular basis. So every, I would say, three months, depending on how sexually active you are, uh, always talking with your doctor, if you can, about your sexual health as well. Or if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can also always Google and look up HIV specific clinics in your area that might be able to give you a little more help. But even if you do contract the virus, it's not the end of the world. It's not the death sentence it was in the 80s. And it's important to realize that as certainly it hasn't been realized by irrelevant hacks, but also by the federal government. In the heat of the AIDS crisis, many laws popped up criminalizing HIV, which means that knowingly spreading the virus was punishable by law. The problem with that is that many people tend not to get tested because then they're not knowingly spreading it. You know, like the great lyricist said, if you don't know. You don't know. You don't know. These laws were all state laws, but as of 2020, 37 states still criminalize HIV. However, recently, Illinois decriminalized HIV, taking that number down to 36. However, the last state to do such was Texas in 1994. And some states, like Minnesota, there are laws on the books so archaic that gay bathhouses can't even exist due to them being, and I quote, structures that are conducive to the spread of communicable disease, but specifically the sexually transmittable disease of acquired immune deficiency syndrome, currently found to be irreversible and uniformly fatal. In fact, it's a chronic health condition that one can live with and be healthy for a very long time. So they really need to update the laws to reflect the science that has since developed since, you know, the 80s and 90s. Exactly. This is damaging not only just for people that have HIV, but for the general public. This is how we get people thinking that you can die of AIDS in two or three weeks. When you can't even die from AIDS, you die from complications of AIDS. It's true. The thing that normally makes people sick and die when they have AIDS is another infection like the flu and also to be clear you have to be very sick and the only way you can get so sick that that happens is by not getting tested and not knowing your status 
and not getting access to treatment. On the note of treatment, for my positive folks out there, you become something called undetectable. If you've seen U equals U on the apps, that just means that undetectable equals untransmissible. However, only through sexual fluids and not by blood. However, not all positive people can become undetectable. And this is where the risk reduction methods that we were talking about before come in handy. In fact, it's often common that you see people who are in a relationship where one partner has HIV and the other partner doesn't, that that partner who does not have HIV may take PrEP in case their partner cannot become undetectable because that's just the way of being in a relationship and taking care of each other. Like the video if you like the video, comment how you reduce risk, and subscribe. As always, my links are down in the description, and have a great rest of your day or whenever you're watching this. Okay, bye!